Are you a leader, manager, entrepreneur, business owner, or knowledge worker? Are you leading people or wondering how to be a better leader in your own life and work? If you are, then you can be experimenting better. Welcome to The Experimental Leader, a podcast that takes a look at the ways leaders are experimenting in their own work. Hosted by Melanie Parrish, we dive into real-life conversations about how people might be using a scientist's mindset and experimenting in their work. Shift your leadership into something that works better. Join us on The Experimental Leader today. Today, I'm here with Vince Molinaro, PhD. He's the founder and CEO of Leadership Contract, Inc., And he's an author, speaker, leadership advisor, and researcher. He's helped create one of the leading brands in the human capital industry, working with several key sectors, including energy, pharmaceutical, professional services, technology, financial services, and the public sector. He's the author of four successful books, Leadership Solutions, The Leadership Gap, The Leadership Contract, and The Leadership Contract Field Guide. His work has been featured in many of the world's leading business publications, including the Harvard Business Review, Forbes, Inc. Magazine, and the World Economic Forum. Vince, I'm so excited to have you on my show today. Thanks so much, Melanie. Thanks for having me. Well, I just want to dive right in, and I really want to ask you to tell us more about the work that you do. What are you up to? I run a uh, leadership essentially a leadership development company. I've been a leadership advisor most of my career. And I've uh, also write and speak extensively and consult with uh, corporations around the world. And most of the times I'm brought in when either a, a senior executive, uh, whether it's a CEO, uh, head of HR, has a fundamental transformational challenge uh, in their business, a new strategy, a turnaround, post M&A, and they need to scale a different kind of leadership across their organization and they need leaders to step up in in new and different ways than they have been. And so that's uh, the kind of the work that I do. Now looking to really take my own company to the next level and building digital solutions and really thinking about consulting a little differently and doing all of that in this world that's been upended for all of us because uh, these moments cause you to rethink a number of things that you've held dear near and dear to your heart uh, for a long time. And so uh, I always get excited by those opportunities to rethink traditional practices and ways of doing business. Yeah, it's such a good time for that. There's almost a blank slate of a, a kind that you can choose, you know, where you want to expand into as time is freed up. Yeah, I agree. I, I do believe for those of us that have the the good fortune to be able to devote some of that time, I think I think it is. I think in many ways, you know, what this global pandemic and crisis has caused us to do is accelerate some trends that had already been happening, I think, in our world, in our society and in business. And they've just been moved much more quickly. You know, the remote work and work from home is probably the, the best example of that. But there's lots of other examples of where you're you know, being put in a position where you can look at things with, uh, you know, a different set of eyes, which is always cool to do. And you have a new book coming out. I think it'll be out by the time this show airs. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, the new book is called Accountable Leaders, and it really shows how leaders can create a culture where in, they inspire everyone to, you know, step up, and demonstrate real ownership, and drive sustainable business results. And uh, I didn't realize it back in you know 2013. I launched a book called uh, The Leadership Contract. It was a New York Times bestseller. The book's done exceptionally well. And that book positioned this idea uh, that a lot of leaders, a lot of people in leadership roles don't fully appreciate what the role really is about. Uh, the reason is most of them get into the roles because they were really good at something technical. They were the best engineer, the best salesperson, the best analyst, the best accountant. And we have had a history of taking those great individual contributors and performers and moving them into leadership roles and not really supporting them. And so a lot of them kind of have to struggle to figure out what it really means to lead. So that book talked about that. If you're in a leadership role, you may not have realized, but you signed up for something really important. And it talks about four terms. And as we were going out around the world, bringing those ideas to organizations, 
what we learned from our clients is they said, yeah, we definitely need our leaders to be accountable at a personal level, which is what the leadership contract is really about. But then I started to hear, but they need to hold others accountable. They need to build an accountable team and they need to work with other leaders across the organization to inspire others to really step up and demonstrate ownership. And so that really became the basis of the new book, Accountable Leaders, that brings more of a, an organizational lens to how leaders need to step up. What it also does is it really shows uh, leaders like CEOs and heads of HR and even directors on boards on what they have to do to build a culture of leadership accountability across an organization. So I didn't realize, as I said, when I started in 2013, that I would have what I'm calling my own nonfiction trilogy between the leadership contract, the leadership contract field guide, and the new book, Accountable Leaders, uh, which will be out June 10th in all major booksellers, whether online or in retail stores. I guess I'm really curious about this idea of the leader being accountable. Leaders often talk about having the people that report to them be accountable. What's the difference? That's the gap. We have this over the last five years. I've traveled to 25 countries. You know, I've been in 80 cities talking to leaders globally around leadership. And it's really, really fascinating when you start talking about accountability because it's a topic that everybody wants. And yet we kind of groan when we have to apply it to ourselves. So it's like, yeah, I want everyone else to be accountable, but not so much myself. And that's, I think, the fundamental problem because I have not met a CEO that I've worked with who looks into his or her organization and sees a ton of leadership accountability gaps. And my research, my global research confirms it. But oftentimes we have this sense that accountability is something you do to people. And I actually think it's something you have to inspire in people. And the way you have to inspire it is by you being an accountable leader yourself. You need to set the tone of accountability. And I didn't realize it at the time, but when I was 16, I uh, I got my very first part-time job. It was in a men's clothing store near a, a mall in my, near my house where I lived. And, and the manager who hired me, Gary, was, he took a bet on me. I was 16. He, he said, you know, you're way too young to be doing, you know, selling clothes to professional men. And, when, you know, it was a men's clothing store for, for men. But, you know, he took a bet on me. And I found that with him, he would inspire me because he would never ask us to do anything he wouldn't do himself. And he just had this energy about him. And then he got promoted to a flagship store of the company. And then in came Steve, his successor, who had a completely different perspective. His famous saying was, don't do as I do, do as I say. And I remember feeling so frustrated by that because I had seen Gary, who set the tone, set the example and and inspired us to be accountable, to drive our performance, to, you know, want to help him succeed. And then Steve, who had a very different view, he had two standards, one for everyone else and one for himself. And I think that is the fundamental crux of the challenge we've got with accountability. It's got to start with you, but then you got to understand you got to drive it with your team, drive it with uh, your direct reports, drive it with your peers, but you have no chance of getting there if you don't start with yourself first. Mm, I think that's so insightful to look at the inspiration as the way to work with accountability in organizations. I I want to shift for just a second and ask how you are experimenting yourself in your business, in your life during this time. Well, you know, from a business standpoint, in a number of ways, in in terms of within our own company, we've been working on a digital platform, you know, that we're launching. You know, most of my work is either consulting advising our clients. It's in developing and running programs based on the ideas in my books. And it's also, you know, in speaking, you know, large large events and and whatnot. That's all, you know, being upended now and for a time being will most likely move primarily virtually. But the work in the digital side was really interesting because that's a technology solution. And when you kind of start with the partners we're working with and a lot of the companies I've interviewed and tried to learn from, it's a very, you need a very experimental mindset. You know, when I go in asking for, so what are the best practices? You know, they'll say there aren't any, you know, Mm. it's really simple. You try something. If it works, you keep doing it. If it doesn't, don't spend too much time worrying about it. Learn from it and move on. That's sort of the experimental nature that I've been taking to my business, which is really adopting more of that experimental mindset around the digital solutions that we're bringing to the marketplace to complement the other solutions we have in place. 
what I'm finding that about that personally is it's actually quite liberating. <laughs> as long as you treat everything as an experiment that you go in with, let's give it a try. Let's see what happens. Let's learn uh, what worked, what didn't work. What do we need to refine? Do we keep doing it? Yes, perfect. Let's go. Uh, do we need to change course? Let's do that. It's a fascinating way to, to move ahead. So I've had to learn to just do less uh, about looking for the answer somewhere and realizing I've got to find the answer. I've got to find my own formula for success. At a personal level, it, you know, what this opportunity you know, has afforded us is to spend more time with family. The interesting thing is my wife and I have got three uh, grown children. Everyone's busy doing their own thing. So our house has become a workplace. We kind of see each other occasionally during the day as people pop into the kitchen to grab a bite or something. But then we kind of congregate at dinner time and we're having far more leisurely dinners. So we're having some really good conversations. So allowing that time for those conversations to happen is, is been, has been kind of cool. I think that's all so interesting. And I, I love the idea of the experimental mindset. I think everyone in the world accidentally became experimenters in the last couple of months. And what I loved about what you said is just that, what did you learn? That to me is the most important question that we ask is what did we learn? And then what? It's fine to experiment, but if you don't collect the data, then (laughs) you're just throwing things at walls. Well, and the challenge that we've had now, particularly, you know, because of COVID-19 is dealing with something at this scale that we hadn't dealt with for a hundred years learning as we're going and then being open to learn of what was happening as different countries were being hit with this over time. Right. And so, you know, if you think about what all the healthcare professionals and healthcare workers at the front line have done, what researchers have done, how companies are working together globally in ways, you know, the whole notion of what, what a crisis allows you to do is, you know, really quite fascinating to watch that happen and how people can rally together. Because if anyone's sitting here pretending they have all the answers, that's not the case. We've not been here before. You need to figure out how to work together, experiment, try things and support one another through that so we can get to a better place at some point in the near future. It's like all the leaders in the world are kind of on the stage visibly we can actually research them and see what worked that they tried and what didn't work that they tried as they, you know, conduct experiments very publicly in real time. We'll be back right after this message. I love talking about data collection and how your next experiment can start to create systematic change in your organization to create a framework for reliable and systematic innovation. Check out my book at book.experimentalleader.com. Take a look at this book and see how you can create sustainable innovation in your own organization. Welcome back to the show. Well, it's interesting, you know, you say that. So I mentioned my global travel. One of the weird things that happened to me as I was doing all of that travel is I would be, this is all pre-COVID, of course, I would be touching down in a country as a major leadership story was breaking out in real time in their country, you know, so Mm -hmm. one Sunday morning in March, uh, a number of years back, I landed in Sao Paulo, Brazil, only to realize that that happened to be the day where 5 million Brazilians, imagine that number, took to the streets across Brazil to protest the corruption in their government. And I happened to be there for a week to talk to people about leadership. Like, how lucky was I? It was the only topic anybody wanted to talk about. Nobody wanted to talk about soccer or anything. It was just leadership because people were fed up with the bad leadership. And that just happened everywhere I went. So the last five to six years, you know, for someone who's a leadership advisor has researched the topic, has written about it. It's been so fascinating. And now you're absolutely right. You know, leaders are under a big spotlight. We look to them and need to look to them at a time of crisis. And we're seeing examples of some exceptional leadership play out in the, either in the political sphere or, or business sphere, and then some dreadful examples at the same time. And so I think that's the part that leaders need to be aware of. I mean, we, we're always kind of looked at, but in crisis, it's even more critical. There's no place to hide, I think. I have a question for you, Vince. When you think about taking some of your products virtual or digital, what are the values that you rest on as you start to grapple with all that experimenting? 
Well, I, I think it's a great question. I, I would say it's a couple of things, right? It's how do you replicate the impact and the kind of magic uh, that we know we, you know, my teams and I were are able to deliver in a traditional classroom facilitated type of session. How are you able to not lose that? To me, it really, you know, I, I've written a lot about and, and consult a lot about this idea of a community of leaders. That the, really the new model of leadership isn't about one person at the top of the hierarchy who has all the answers. That was the kind of model of leadership that existed when I started my career you know, many, many years ago. Now it's more about bringing leaders together, sharing their perspectives, their ideas in more of a sense of community. And so the opportunity is how do you leverage the technology and create communities of, of learning around leadership so people feel supported with one another? You know, a great example is, you know, we launched this app, the Accountable Leaders app, first week of May. And we've been holding during this period of time a weekly community call for those who have signed up for the community. And they happen every Friday morning. And so this morning, it was great, uh, because one leader who joined, you know, kind of looked to the community for support. And he said, you know, I'm kind of new in my role. And if I'm going to be honest, I think the company made a mistake. (laughs) I don't know why they gave me the role. He was doubting himself, right? And, you know, we've all been in that position and can relate to him, but he felt that within his own organization, he, he didn't think he could kind of be open, but in this community, he felt that he could. And he got tremendous support and perspectives by people who were on that call who were also able to kind of relate to what he was saying and kind of, you know, give him some guidance and to say that that's perfectly normal. And I sort of said, I'd rather hear a leader express that then express complete overconfidence because at least you're being honest with yourself and you have a humility about your role. So that community piece, I think that connection piece is what's going to be critical. And it's what I think is helping us at this time, you know, platforms like Zoom and MS Teams and Skype, you know, it's not the same as being in a room, like if you and I were in a room sharing a coffee uh, together, but we're still able to do this, right? And that is one way of maintaining that connection and community. Well, and I'm sure you have had this experience in your life, but one of the biggest surprises for me as a coach, and I've been a coach for about 20 years and starting to talk to leaders is how ubiquitous that imposter syndrome is that Mm -hmm. it, everybody has it. If they're stretching into the corners of what's possible for themselves It's so interesting. And I work with a lot of new leaders, people who are really technically skilled and they get promoted (laughs) and then they, Mm -hmm. they're looking for help. And, and it is so much a part of the landscape, that self doubt. Yeah. And it's understandable because the role has become more demanding. The expectations are greater and the leadership roles in many ways demands more than any one person. You know, I was 27 when I started my first company, you know, as an entrepreneur and How's the business going? And, and I would say the business would be great if I wasn't running it <laughs> because every single day you confront your own limitations and your business demands certain things from you. And I've had many strengths, but I also have areas that are not as strong. And, and that's true of someone in a leadership role as well. But, you know, and then we get hit with a global pandemic and that creates another, you know, your context defines uh, leadership in many ways. So I think a lot of leaders are Put in a, been thrust into a position of, boy, I hope I can lead myself, my teams, my company through this time. I think that's a healthy place to be uh, because there's a sense of humility there. I think the arrogance and this attitude of I've got this, I think that's more risky. Anybody say that in my practice for a while? <laughs> uh, interesting. <laughs> yeah. There's nobody that thinks they've got it right now. I would agree. And that's a good thing. <laughs> I agree. It is yeah. interesting. There's a lot to try. I'm curious, you talk in my notes here. I'd love to hear about how you build a strong leadership accountability and that leads to a competitive advantage. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so part of it is based on global research I've done that has looked at leadership accountability and by kind of identifying and asking companies, you know, is leadership accountability critical? How satisfied are you with the extent of, you know, the extent that leaders are stepping up and being accountable? And with a lot of this kind of research that firms do, there's always a question around, can you please self-identify 
based on your company's performance over the last three years, is your company an industry leader, kind of an average performer or a laggard, a poor performer? Where do you kind of slot in? Now, it's a, granted, it's all self-identified, but assuming that people are giving you the right answer. And when we cut the data based on those three groups, what you consistently find is that there's actually a critical link between leadership accountability and company performance. And the companies who are industry leaders tend to have consistently higher ratings of satisfaction with the degree of accountability demonstrated by leaders. They feel that most of their leaders are deemed to be accountable. They say they have stronger leadership cultures, and they do a much better job at addressing the leaders who are struggling in their roles, who may be unaccountable or mediocre compared to the others. So the data is absolutely clear that accountability and company performance are completely intertwined and connected with one another. And so that's kind of the first step. There's a research that, that does that. And in accountable leaders, I kind of map out you know, an approach for organizations on how they need to get stronger. And the first thing is they have to make it a priority. I can't tell you how many conversations I've had where they agree, yeah, this is a problem, and they do nothing about it. So you've got to make it a priority. Uh, number two is you've got to set really clear expectations of your leaders. I, I basically say, call it a, a leadership contract for the company that says, here's where we're setting the bar and the standard for our leaders. This is what it means to be a leader in our company. And my research reveals less than half of companies even do that. So it's very hard for a leader, even if I have the intention to be accountable, it's hard for me to step up if the organization hasn't made it clear what that means. Well, you know, what does good look like? What does stepping up look like? What am I being held accountable to? What are the standards for leaders? So that's the other thing. The third thing is you do have to do some of the hard work and not a lot of companies shy away from addressing the leaders who are mediocre. They don't know how to handle them at all. And sometimes it's not the fault of the leaders. We, we, like you said, we, Melanie, we thrust people into leadership roles because they're great technical performers. We don't give them the development or support they need to learn the craft of leadership. And so they acquire all these bad habits. And sometimes we miss the most obvious thing. We promote them into the roles without ever asking them, is this something that you really want to do? Are you really jazzed about being a leader? And what you find is there's a certain percentage of people in leadership roles who actually still think of themselves as the technical, like they don't even think of themselves as leader. leaders. They think of themselves as whatever their technical expertise was. And so they're kind of imposter. They're pretending. <laughs> and when you confront it with them, they kind of go, listen, I just said yes because you asked me. But can I go back to being an engineer? Can I go back to being the accountant? Can I go back to being the analyst? Because that's really what my passion and love is. This managing teams and people, that's not for me. And I think we have to be more deliberate at tackling that. And then the fourth thing companies need to do is really build a leadership culture by bringing leaders together face-to-face or virtually so that they can build relationships, collaborate, and drive innovation more effectively. So that's kind of how you translate it. But all of it is based on the research, as I said, that shows this connection between accountability and company performance. I I have a question about the addressing mediocre leaders, just because in my work, I often know someone in an organization needs to go about six months before they go because the leaders start talking about them. Yeah, How do you know when it's time to exit someone? So first off, addressing mediocre leaders doesn't mean you exit them all. That's not the point. It's you begin by having a conversation around your performance isn't where it needs to be as a leader. Well, now the question is, see, this is where the organization has to take accountability, right? So if you haven't sent clear expectations of leaders and they're struggling to step up, well, is it their issue or is it your issue as an organization that you haven't made it clear to them? right? So you've got to kind of diagnose all the kind of issues that could be contributing to that mediocrity. But let's assume you've got that, those expectations in place, then it's really around that decision. That's the first term of my leadership contract is, so did you take this job because of the title and the perks and the pay? Is leadership something that you really want to be good at? And ask them, where would you be happier? Being in a technical role you know, being that technical expert that we need you to be or leading teams. And a lot of times people will, even when we go in and work with our clients and, you know, I do a keynote or we run a leadership contract session, 
uh, you'll find some leaders put up their hand going, okay, I got to come clean here. This isn't my thing. Can I go back to a technical role? Because that's where I'm going to feel I'm going to add more value. So it's not just about exiting people. It's about having that conversation first. And sometimes I have found leaders who were struggling, once you make the expectations clear, they kind of go, oh, I get it now. Okay, no, no, I want to do that. And then they go after it. And then, of course, there's going to be that small subset where you do need to take action. And I think the question around how long, you've got to define a period of time where you have the conversation and say, is this something you want to do? Yes. Okay, if the answer is yes, okay, well, you've got three months or six months to kind of get your performance to the next level. And if at that point in time you can't, then we're having a different conversation. That's kind of what I've seen seems to work in action. It's not, just to be clear, it's not about seeing someone struggle in their role and you exit them. That's not the strategy at all. Though a lot of companies tend to like to leave people in mediocre, like who are mediocre in the roles, and that's not good for them, it's not good for the organization. Or what I've heard a lot of, which is quite surprising, is they take a mediocre leader and they move them into the HR function. So they move them out of the business so they're not having any collateral damage on the business and put them in HR because they don't want to let that person go, whether they're loyal to them, the person's been a long-term employee, whatever is the case. Now you got someone who's struggling and now you've put him in one of the most important functions in, in the company, HR, and now you've got other problems that you're going to deal with. <laughs> That's super interesting. Yeah. You've got a lot going on in your business. You've got a book coming out. You've got, you know, you're going digital. What do you do for self-care for yourself as a leader? Well, pretty much every morning, uh, well now, uh, but even before that, work out every morning. And, and that's a combination of cardio and body weight training and stretching. Uh, I'm an active walker. And when the weather is better, I, I you know, play a little bit of tennis and I keep myself fairly active. Also try to manage, you know, in a deliberate way, my reaction to things, bring a bit of, you know, try to bring optimism to, you know, say in this case, to my family, to my colleagues and coworkers when I can. And if I've ever found myself in situations where they haven't been great, like if ever, you know, I've learned early in my career, you know, life's too short to work for a bad boss or a mediocre manager, I would give it a period of time and then I would leave. I just try to find the environments. It's even when I work with clients, I try to work with find clients where there's an alignment of values, kind of share a common vision of what of the work we're trying to do together. And when you do it, it's magic. But if you're when the fit isn't there, if the values don't work, then you just run into a ton of stress and frustration. And it doesn't matter how much they pay you. It's not worth it. And it's not worth it for them or for you. And so I really try to minimize the stress that I'm encountering either professionally or personally. But the core practice is taking care of myself, you know, physically through working out deliberate and regular basis. I'd love for you to tell everyone who's listening where they can find you. The easiest place is on LinkedIn. So it's, uh, you know, Vince Molinero on LinkedIn. That's the platform I primarily use. My website is uh, drvincemolinero.com. So those are the two, the two places where people can track me down. That's great. It's been such a pleasure to have you here today. I've enjoyed our conversation. It's such a privilege to get to think of questions and ask someone who's such an expert in the leadership world. Thanks for coming on my show. Thanks, Molly. Appreciate it and love the questions and uh, got me thinking about some things I haven't thought about in a, in a while. So thank you for that. Appreciate oh, you're so welcome. This is Melanie Parrish, and I so enjoyed talking to Vince Molinaro about how he uses the value of replicating the impact of his work as he moves to digital. I think it's so interesting to think about impact as a way to pivot. How do you have things feel the same or have the same impact as you go forward? I also love the idea of accountability for leaders as opposed to using accountability to control the people that you lead. I think shifting that is a really great look at doing it differently. I loved hearing how he talks about a community of leaders and bringing leaders together. I think 
that openness of communication helps people be better at the work they do. And the open feedback loops, the open flow of information makes people better leaders across the board. It was great to have Vince Molinaro on with me today. Go experiment. Thank you for joining us on another episode of The Experimental Leader. We hope you have found value in today's episode because we are dedicated to helping you become the experimental leader you want to be. To access the show notes or learn more about working with Melanie, visit melanieparish.com. Go experiment.